The devil had the same three options. And so he began to fight. And every time God would come up with a plan, well, the devil would be right there to last it up. Now, man, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Satan looked down into that crib and he said, this is the cat. This is the one that's supposed to stomp my head. Everything I've tried to do, no matter how I've tried to louse God up, he's always been one step ahead of me. And so here's this Jesus cat, and he's the Messiah. And if I'm ever going to get away from getting my head stomped, I've got to get rid of this kid. Well, he couldn't do anything to Jesus while he was young because the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord hovered over Jesus and he grew in the admonition of the Lord and in learning and in teaching and God overshadowed him with his protection and nothing happened to him. Satan knew that he couldn't get to Jesus directly. So what he had to do is he had to go and he had to corrupt the people around Jesus. And he did a real good job of it. And if you'll notice when you read the word that Satan didn't try and corrupt the street people. He didn't try and go to the garbage people and corrupt them at least not the ones that Jesus has touched with his love, he went to the religious folks. He corrupted the church against the Lord. And the nice religious folks, one night they arrested the Lord while he was at prayer. They trumped up a bunch of false charges against him. They had a mockery of a trial. They handed him over to the Roman government. And the Roman government, in order to please them and try and... Uh, you know, keep things at rest with these uh, hot-headed Jews, decided that they would uh, give a little punishment to Jesus. He'd been accused of treason. He'd been accused of blasphemy. He'd been accused of so many things that, you know, it's like he was really framed good. So the Roman governor decided, well, he says, you know, I'll placate these Jews and I'll take this guy out and have him scourged, and that should be enough for anybody. So they tied Jesus like a criminal, and they drug him out to a place called the Court of the Pavements. And in the middle of the Court of the Pavements, there's a post. And at the top of this, this tall finger column of, of wood, there's a big ring. And this thing is called a scourging post. And they take the rope that ties Jesus' hands, see? And they throw the end of the rope through the ring on the top of this post. And then they pull down on that rope until they got Jesus suspended by his arms until nothing is touching the ground but his tiptoes. They tie the rope off, or they step back and they rip Jesus' robe off his back. And they see that his skin is nice and tight so that when the scourge hits him, that it'll be sure to rip and bleed and tear, that it just won't be wasted motion. Then they bring out the scourge itself. And if there was any more diabolical instrument of torture than the scourge in those days, I don't really think I could think of what it would be. But because the scourge was a whip with one handle and a lot of tongues. And all down the length of each tongue of the scourge, there was a piece of metal tied or bone or, or stick, something sharp and jagged, old pieces of metal. And the tip of each one of the tongues of the scourge was tipped off with lead. And the man that was carrying this scourge was a man who was in charge of the entire disciplinary actions taken against the whole Roman legion that was there in Jerusalem. He was kind of like the sergeant of arms. Big old muscled guy who'd flogged just hundreds of legionnaires before. And he came out there and he was far from his home. He wanted to go back to Italy. He was tired. He was tired of foreign wars. He was tired of being in a place he didn't like, a bunch of people he didn't understand with customs that were weird. And this was a chance for him to take out some of his animosity and frustration against the leader of these Jews. So he walked up to this task with real relish, you know. And he took out this big old whip and he shook it out. And he looked at Jesus and he measured his distance from Jesus to him. And he took this scourge and he took his big muscled arm and he brought it up. And he brought that whip whistling down on Jesus' back. And the tongues of that scourge, they wrapped themselves around Jesus' body. And they stuck into him and the pieces of metal clawed at him. The length of each one of the thongs had been coated with sheep's blood. And bits of pottery, had broken pottery and stuff, had been kind of glued to each one. So each strand just stuck onto Jesus and clawed into his flesh. And the tips of the, of the, of the scourge ends, the lead tips, would cut into him and gouge him. 
And when the man had a good bite on Jesus, he would twist the whip and pull so that great big chunks of meat were ripped off of Jesus' body and he was cut open. And Jesus took 39 stripes like that. 39 times that man's arm came up and fell. 39 times that whip bit into Jesus. At the middle of the scourging, the man had to change and whip Jesus on the other side because one side of his body had already been reduced to raw hamburger meat and there just wasn't enough sound flesh left to beat. The historian of the day says that Jesus Christ was reduced to human rubble. It says, the, the histories of the day say that there was not one inch on Jesus' body that wasn't cut or bruised or bleeding or, or gashed open or something. Then they cut him down. And the executioner gave the rest of the legionnaires a chance to take out some of their frustrations. Someone had called him the king of the Jews, so one of the Roman legionnaires went and got a, a purple robe. And they flung it over Jesus' battered body. And it was on there, and they got, a, they got a crown made out of thorns. And the thorns were about like this, about, oh, about five to six inches long. And they were hard as nails, old Judean thorns. And they braided a crown for him, and they stuck it up on his head, and they beat it down around his ears with rods until it was just stuck into his scalp and stuck into his head and gouging into his face. And they put a scepter in his hand, and they mocked him. And they spit on him. And they pulled out his beard in fistfuls. And they called him a king. And laughed at him. And the Bible says they smote him in the face. And the Greek word there that they use for the word to smite is the same Greek word that they use for striking a man with a closed fist. It's the word or the root word for the word pugilism, which means boxing. And it was striking Jesus in the face with a fist. They punched Jesus out. The whole company did. When they got done with that, they drug him back in and gave him back to the Roman procurator named Pilate. And Pilate brought him out to the crowd. This was the same crowd that a week before had hailed him as Messiah. It said that they'd love him, that they would follow him, that they'd stick by him. Pilate brought him out to the crowd and stood him before the crowd. And next to him stood a condemned murderer named Barabbas. And Pilate says, it's Passover time. I'll give you either one of these men you want. I'll give you this murderer, Barabbas, or I'll give you this man here in whom I can find no fault. I'll give you Jesus, who is supposed to be your king. Now, which do you want? And on top of the scourging, on top of the humiliation, on top of the pain and the loss of blood, Jesus had to stand there and watch the people he loved turn his, their back on him and scream for the release of Barabbas. He had to stand there and watch while he was deserted by everybody he cared for. And he had to stand there and listen to the shouts of, Give us Barabbas. We want Barabbas. Crucify Jesus. Crucify him. We want Barabbas. And they took him out and they ripped that purple robe off his back after they had a chance to congeal with the blood. And it ripped every one of Jesus' wounds open again and he began to bleed all over again. And they put his own robe on his back. They settled a 200-pound cross on his back and made him walk up the Via Della Rosa, the Way of Sorrows it's called now. But it's the street in Jerusalem that's probably the steepest one there. And as he started making his way up there, he was weak, he was beaten, he was deserted, his disciples weren't even in the area, and he fell. He was just too much. The emotional strain, a loss of blood, he fell under his cross. And a man stepped out of the crowd, a man named Simon of Cyrene. And the Bible says, doesn't say what nationality he was, but tradition says that he was a black man. And this man came out and picked the cross up took it up for Jesus and carried it the west of the way to Golgotha, to Calvary, the place of the skull. And they put that cross down on the ground and they ripped Jesus' robe off his back again and made him bleed again. They threw him down naked on the cross. They stretched his arms out. They got an eight-inch spike. They took that eight-inch spike and they placed it in the middle 
of the lower part of his hands where the small bones are. So they took that nail, they put his hand against the wood, they put a foot in his palm, put the nail down in the heel of his hand and took this big mallet and they drove that nail through his flesh and bones into that wood. And then they stretched out his other hand and they did the same. And then they did his feet. They took one foot, placed it on top of the other, in step to sole. Then they took a 12 inch spike. They put it in the middle of his top insep, drove it out through both feet and out through his back heel and nailed him to the cross. And he, they, then they picked up that cross. They picked it up and they dropped it into a hole in the ground. Then they brought wedges out and nailed the wedges in and Jesus hung between heaven and earth. As he hung on his hands in his weakened condition, the pain was such that it ran down his arms into his chest and caused massive diaphragm spasms and pinched off his lungs so that he couldn't breathe. And so the only way that Jesus could get relief from that was to push all of his weight up on the nail in his feet and stand upright and gasp a couple of gasps of air. And it was during those times that he pushed himself upright to gasp for air that he said such things as, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, it wasn't just for the Roman soldiers he said that. He was looking all the way down through history, and he was looking right at you. Right at you, sister, and right at you, brother, and right at you two sisters, and you, brother. He was looking at me and every one of us that he was hanging on that cross for because he wasn't just hanging on the cross for the previous sins of the world or even for the sins of the world that he lived in. He was hanging on the cross for, for your sins and my sins too. And finally he pushed himself up for one last time and he said, it is finished. And his head fell forward on his chest and he slumped back down in his arms for the last time and he died. He'd lived for three hours on the cross that way, if you call that life. And when he died, he chose the time and hour and place of his death. Because when he died, he gave his spirit up. And his mother and his brothers came, and they took him down. And by brothers, I mean his friends. And they took him down, and they put him in a borrowed tomb because the Lord of glory could not afford a hole in the ground. He didn't have enough money to even afford a grave. And they put him in that place and they rolled a stone in front of it. They put a great big blob of red sealing wax up there. They got the big Roman Imperator, you know, the seal of the emperor. And they stuck that big eagle in there and made this big eagle symbol on the grave. Posted a Roman guard and said, anybody that breaks this seal, will put them to death immediately. Because they knew the stories that it got to them even where they were, what was intended. And they didn't want anybody to steal Jesus' body. And it got dark. And it got quiet. And from the shadows stepped a figure. His name was Satan. And he walked over in front of that grave. And he looked at the stone and the seal. He crossed his arms across his chest. He reared back and he said, Ha! I've won. Well, God, what now? I've won. What a fool. You've sent your own, your own son like a lamb to the slaughter. Ha! You think this loving, kind individual could beat me? I've won. I always knew I'd won anyway. This is going to stomp my head? <laughs> He's dead. He's beaten. He's in a hole in the ground. Nobody could get him out of there. <laughs> I've won. Finally, after all these years, all the way since Genesis 3.15, I've been fighting this fight, and I finally won. <sighs> Gia, all I'm good at is fighting God. I, I don't really know 
what to do with myself now that I got the Messiah taken care of. I, hmm. I guess I have time off. What should I do with time off? I've never had time off before. I know. I saw some people do this once and it really looked good. And I think maybe now I've got some time off, I'll do it. I think I'll have a picnic. Sounds good, I'll have a picnic. And so the devil went down to hell and he got his big picnic basket, see? And he got all this stuff in it that devils like, you know? Deviled eggs and deviled ham and a big jar of jalapeno peppers, the hottest ones you can get, you know? Stuck them right in the old basket and he started to walk out of hell and he remembered. He says, hey man, I got a big corporation here. I can't just walk out and leave it unattended. So he got on his intercom, you know, and he got hold of the secretary. Her name's Demona. He said, hey Demona. He says, I want you to call up my two lieutenants, uh, Death and Corruption. You know, Corruption, his other name is Grave. And I want you to send him over, to send him over here to me because I want to leave him in charge while I go on my, my holiday here. So old Demona got hold of him and they came up to the office and reported, you know. And uh, the devil said, Death. He said, I got a special job for you. He says, I want you to take over hell while I'm gone on my picnic. He says, but the special job I got is, he says, I got that uh, Jew up there, Jesus, and he's in this hole in the ground, and like he is really dead, man, and I want you to make sure he stays that way. I mean, I want you to wrap yourself around him, and I want you to hold on to him like you never held on to anybody before. And, and Death said, well, man, who have I ever let go? He says, I know I missed Enoch, but I turned my head and he was gone. What could I do? And he said, and I tried to catch that Elijah cat, and I burned the sleeves right off my best robe because them fiery chariots are a bummer, you know. <laughs> but the thing about it is, anybody I've ever got my old bony fingers on, I've still got. And then the devil turned around to corruption. He says, okay. He says, now death's going to hold him. Now corruption, he says, what I want you to do, he says, is I want you to just like dissolve him to dirt. Just, you know, dissolve him to ashes and just blow him away because I don't want to even have any traces of Jesus left when I get back. And, and old corruption said, well, man, anybody he can hold, I can rot, you know. And so the devil left and he, he went and he had a great picnic and it lasted for three days. And then he came back to hell. He was all happy because he won, you know, and he came in whistling, you know. <laughs> You know, that's just a song I made up. Don't anybody think it's rock and roll? Uh, I, know, uh, I know everybody thinks that the rock and roll is of the devil. Anyway, he was whistling and everything like that. And uh, he came up and he unlocked the big old gates of hell and he pushed them open and he, he locked them back up, you know, he shut them. <laughs> and he locked them up, you know, and he walked off down the uh, corridor there and uh, he got down by his office, you know. And he walked around the corner by his office and there was his two lieutenants, old death and corruption. They were standing there going, Hi, have a nice uh, trip. <laughs> and the devil said, don't tell me something went wrong. And Death said, well, he said, uh, sorry, boss. I mean, I really tried to hold Jesus, but uh, there was something about him. I, I couldn't hold him. Corruption said, yeah. He says, that was weird. I couldn't even touch him. Not only could I not put corruption on him, I couldn't even touch him. And while these three old uglies were sitting there talking, the devil looked down one of them long, dark corridors in hell, the longest, ugliest, blackest pit in hell, where there'd been suffering from the beginning of time. He looked way down at the bottom of that pit, and for the very first time ever, a little light came on. And that light shone out bright way down there in the pit, and it started coming toward the old devil and old death and corruption. And as it came forward, it got bigger and bigger and brighter and brighter and bigger and bigger and the really weird thing was that every time one of these beams of light would hit one of the cell doors you know where the so where the spirits of the people were kept why well, a cell door would just pop open and those people would come out and they'd be praising God and they would be singing Hosanna and they'd be singing hallelujah and they'd be glorifying the name of the Lord 
and everything was just in chaos and people were running free and hell was all lit up and the devil was shaking all over and he looked way down in the deep part of that light to see where it was coming from and guess who it was that was coming striding through the, through the corridors of hell. Well, it was Jesus. That was who. It wasn't the beaten, crucified Jew of the cross, but it was the risen, glorified Lord of glory, the one that's called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And man, he came striding through the old, old corridors and hell, man, and all the people were with him, and they were all shouting hallelujah and praise God, and old Jesus walked right up to the old corruption, and he grabbed him in this hand, and he threw him that way, and he grabbed old death around the neck and threw him that way, and he reached out and grabbed the old devil by the front of his shirt, Took him three times real good and hard and said, hand over them keys, turkey, you know. And I tell you, man. <laughs> and so the old devil went down and got the keys to death held in the grave out, you know, this big old key ring he had. He went through the A's and the B's and the C's and the D's and he got down to the J's, you know, and he got off the one that said, Jesus and Nazareth on it. And Jesus took it, and he looked at it, and he said, Well, that's pretty good. He says, But uh, see, I can see into the future, which is something you can't do, devil, because if you could have seen in the future, you'd never had me crucified, because that's what we had in mind the whole time. <laughs> and uh, if you could see in the future, you could see way down here, way down August 22nd, 1966, in a mop closet, Navy boot camp, there's a fellow by the name of Mike Warnke. And he's going to need his key. And so while I'm here, old devil, why don't you just give me Mike Warnke's key too? As a matter of fact, as I see into the future, I see there are a lot of Mike Warnke's. A lot of people who are going to need their keys. So while I'm here, I'll just take them all. And he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave away from Satan. He shoved Satan aside. He went up and put his hand in the middle of the gates of hell and pushed him over. Boom! And he walked out. And he led all of those people that had been captive free. And he went up to heaven. And right on the corner of Faith Avenue and Hallelujah Boulevard, he opened this key shop. <laughs> and it's been doing a jam-up business for 2,000 years, man. Just jam-up. The message, the message we have for you is not how to be religious, not how to be holier than thou, not how to be better than the next guy, or not how to be uh, so heavenly conscious you're not earthly good. The message we have to you is there is a key shop, and your job, as long as you live, is to take the key that you've got the one that not only fit your chains, but it fit your ignition too. Because if you work it just right, when you get set free, you can get turned on at the same time. You know what I mean? And keep chugging for the Lord. And when you see a person that's just like you, go up and say, hey man, see this key? I know where you can get one that'll fit what you need too. That's our job as Christians. And that's what you're looking for. Those of you that are out there and you're really searching and looking for the answer, the key is what you need. We're not preaching church. We're not preaching religion. We're preaching giving Jesus a chance to fit a key to your lock and set you free. Thank you.